Get it? Okay. All right. So this Hilton is here in the context of this exhibit, Portraits in Action, Pioneers in Renewable Energy, Environmental Conservation, and Land Use Planning, which was a multi-year research project that we undertook, speaking with people who played a, a leadership role in each of those arenas. John Ewing, for example, Smart Growth Vermont, uh, Darby Bradley, the Vermont Land Trust, Hilton Dyer, Renewable Energy, people who have had a long time, long standing, and I would say particularly in the case of those folks who were involved with renewable energy, a passionate interest in, in renewable energy and its significance to our economy, our environment, and our future. So when this exhibit was coming together, I queried everyone who was uh, going to be featured in the exhibit to say, do you have any suggestions for programming that we could do? And to my delight, uh, there, there were a number of suggestions, including one from Hilton who said, yeah, I could do a, a solar workshop or a, a solar presentation. Yep. And so here we are. Yeah. Really? Yeah, with many thanks to Hilton. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not going to introduce you, in, I, you know, I didn't think to ask for like a mini bio, even yeah. though you sent one to right. me earlier. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I hope that you will, as a part of this evening, kind of place yourself in this work. Okay. But I have been talking to people this week and in the weeks preceding this saying, yeah, Hilton Dyer is going to be here and he's doing a workshop. And as I was telling Hilton, it, there are lots of people who feel connected to Hilton through the Maritime Museum, but in other ways as well. Yeah. And today, I, I, uh, one fellow was telling me, he said, uh, yeah, Hilton Dyer did this program about um, solar energy and he he used the most, uh, the simplest uh, illustration for how to evaluate the solar potential of a particular site, uh -huh. which he says you call the um, Billy Graham method. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm yeah. going to do that. Oh, okay, yeah. great. I'm, so I'm, I'm not going to steal your no, thunder. No, no, no. I'm going to do the Billy Graham method yeah. tonight. So yes. thank you so much for Pleasure. coming. Pleasure. Great to have you here. Right on. Great to have you here. And. Um, we have a small audience, but there's one more person coming. I know. Great. So. That's that. It, right. the, the the size of the audience is not as important yeah. as the character of their engagement. Right. So here we go, and uh, this also is headed for MCTV. So okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, uh, whoops. So uh, yeah, I'm mostly involved in solar electricity, in uh, doing installations that produce electricity from the sun. And like that, there I am standing in between two arrays. And this is what most people think of when they think of solar and the solar industry and, and you know, what's going on in solar today. Um, they think of this or that or that, but that's only a small part of it, and I'm not really going to be talking about that that much today, um, because of um, uh, a guy named uh, well, not because of, but an illustration here by a guy named Peter about the the Peter curve, um, about what you get out of changing your energy picture, and basically it's a curve what's called an asymptotic curve, a curve that flattens out. And so you want to start with energy efficiency. And for the amount of money you spend, that gets you the farthest up the curve to, to fix the hole in the bucket before you try to fill the bucket. And then the next thing that gets you farther up the curve is passive solar, just uh, either building or renovating uh, buildings so that they take advantage of the sun and then the final bit of the curve is active solar like solar electricity, solar hot water, things like that and uh, 
super insulation, the so-called passive house work and things like that. And that gets you the last little bit. There's a saying in engineering that the last 10% costs you the last 50%. And that is in, uh, uh, in action here. Um, that when you're trying to, to get that last little bit of, of uh, uh, non-fossil fuel energy uh, advantage, that's the last half of your dollars, that last little bit of improvement there. So we start with energy efficiency, and then we go to passive solar, and then to this. Um, just uh, to make you think about that energy efficiency in a certain way, um, we've all seen hot air balloons, right? Uh, and a hot air balloon lifts a bunch of people off the ground and equipment simply because the air in the balloon is 150 degrees hotter, 175 degrees hotter than the air surrounding it. So it's buoyant, it's less dense, and it lifts a lot of weight. Now, if you have a 2,000 square foot home with eight foot ceilings, and it's 68 degrees in your home, and it's zero degrees outside, if you could put your home on a scale, your home would be about 200 pounds lighter than it would be in the summer with the windows open. It's like a very poorly engineered hot air balloon. It's not going to lift off of its foundation because your house weighs tons, but it is 200 pounds lighter. So if you have a tiny little crack way up at the top of your house and a tiny little hole where you know the frame of your house meets the foundation, there's 200 pounds of lift trying to make air come into your house, cold air come into your house and warm air go out of your house, which you will then have to heat. So your house just naturally has a certain number of air changes every hour. New air comes in, you spend money to heat it, and it goes out again. And if you can reduce the number of air changes that your house makes in an hour, you're going to save a lot of money. So that's where this is right here. Air sealing is a, is a big part of it. And that is also really cost efficient because a case of tubes of uh, that silicone caulk and a case of those little cans of foam will pay for itself in one December, basically. Uh, and you're just making money on it after that. So it's really the, the most efficient, effective thing you can do is to plug up the holes in your house. Um, and then go on to the other thing. So I just have to put in a, a, a plug, so to speak, for that. Um, and so, once we get past efficiency, sealing up your house, um, we get to the solar part. Now, there's going to be a quiz, a very brief quiz, and I think, I think you're all gonna snap right to it. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Wrong. Um, your second grade teacher lied to you. Or I should say mostly wrong, mostly wrong. 363, 365ths wrong. Because the sun only actually rises and sets in the east and the west exactly on September 21st and March 21st, the equinoxes. Um, because the earth is tilted, as it goes around the sun. Sometimes it's leaning, the northern hemisphere is leaning towards the sun and sometimes it's leaning away. And halfway in between, it's sort of leaning sideways to the sun. And on those days, those two days, we have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night and the sun rises exactly in the east and sets exactly in the west. And every other day of the year, the sun rises and sets somewhere to the south of east and west or somewhere to the north of east and west. And it can be as much up here near the Canadian border, 45 degrees north. It can be as much as 34 degrees south of east and south of west and 34 degrees north of east and north and west. And now you might be thinking to yourself, 
okay, be pedantic. It kind of rises in the East and it kind of sets in the West. I mean, no need to be picky here. Except that it's very important to passive solar, to your house. Because sometimes you want to let the sun in, in the winter, and sometimes you want to keep the sun out in the summer. And that has all, everything to do with where the sun rises and sets and where it goes through the sky. So I'm going to be a little bit theoretical at the moment here, and I'll, then I'll show you what I mean. But this is a chart of all the sun paths throughout the year on the 21st of the month for Warren, Vermont, which is close enough to here. This is the one I could chart I could find at, at short notice. And you'll notice that here's east, 90 degrees, right? And there's west, 270 degrees. And you can see that only in September and March on the 21st does it actually rise and set right there. And it goes up a little over 45 degrees at noon, the middle of the day. Whereas in December, you can see that it rises well south of east, and it only goes up to about maybe 22, 23 degrees off the horizon, and then it comes down here well to the south of west. Whereas on June 21st, the summer solstice, it rises about 35 degrees, 34 degrees north of east, it goes up to almost 70 degrees above the horizon, and it sets north of west. So, why do we care about that? Well, think about a house, your standard house with a pitched roof, and imagine that south is directly that way. Now, here's your house like this with the roof ridge going north-south. The, the small end of the house, the short end of the house, is pointing to the south. You're, let's say you're just designing the house. You haven't built it yet. Here's a way you can save 10% on your heating and cooling costs. You take the house and you rotate it 90 degrees so that the long side is facing south and the short sides are facing east and west. Well, why would this save you energy? Well, I'm going to do a little arm waving here, but in the winter, when you want the sun to come in, your properly oriented house, here's sunrise over here, and here's sunset over there, right? They're not straight out, they're here and there. So the sun is going to be going right here. And the long side of your house with all the windows on it, all that window area, is going to be aimed right at where the sun is in the winter. And then in the summer, I'm going to do a little yoga here, I'm going to do a stretch. The sun is going to be rising back here. And as it's rising, it's going to be beaming in on the short end of your house without a lot of windows, without as many windows as the long side. And then when it gets around to the south, it's going to be way up in the sky. So it's going to be beaming down on your roof and not in your southern windows. And then in the afternoon, it's going to be setting over here. And it's again going to be beaming in on the short end of your house where there aren't so many windows. So it's not going to come in your windows and heat, in, heat up your house in the summer as much. However, if we turn the house back again so the long sides are east and west, in the summer, the sun's going to come up off the horizon and just start blasting into the long side of your house. And it's going to continue to illuminate the long side of your house till it's way up in the sky. And it's going to overheat your house. And then for a short while in the middle of the day, it'll be beaming down on the roof. And then it's going to start going down again in the afternoon. And it's going to be beaming in on the long side of your house again and heating it up. Whereas in the winter, it's just going to be shining on the short end of your house down here and not giving you all that much. So the orientation of the house is really important. So that's why we care 
about where the sun is and where it's shining in. Because you can orient your house and put in shading and put in windows so that your house is welcoming in the sun when you want it to be welcomed in and keeping the sun out when you don't want it in in the summer. Um, so here just for example Albany, Georgia, you can see that the sun goes a lot higher just for an example, the sun goes a lot higher it actually rises and sets a little bit closer to uh, true east and true west and it's a lot higher in December as well so people designing houses down in Albany, Georgia have to account for the fact that the sun's going to be higher in the sky a lot of the time and here's where we get to the Billy Graham part of the program um, so what people have figured out studying the sun and, and uh, when, it, when it puts in energy and all that. If you have something facing south, like solar panels or a bunch of windows, about 85%, 90% of the energy that you get from the sun is going to occur, is going to actually hit your house between about 8.30 in the morning, about 3.30 in the afternoon. Because before that and after that, the sun is going to be way over here, and it's going to be coming in at a very acute angle, and it's going to be reflecting off your windows or reflecting off your solar panels. And way over here in the afternoon, it's going to be doing the same thing. And it's only in here that it's really going to be giving you the most energy. And that, that, it doesn't matter whether you've got the hot water panels or solar electric panels, or uh, windows, or whatever. That's where it is. So, you also notice that here's, here's the curve of December 21st. Um, that below about 22 degrees or so, you don't really have to worry about anything blocking you. This is a, a drawing with a sort of a landscape in the background. Here's a building, here's some trees and all that. And you can see that at certain times of the year, like uh, in uh, September 21st, March 21st, the sun's going to be blocked for a while first thing in the morning as it's coming up, right? And then it'll be clear. And again, on March 21st, September 21st, you can see it's going gonna, it's gonna to go behind this building here, right? And it'll be shaded. So if you're, if you're trying to ask yourself, well, here's a site. Is this a good site for a solar heated house? Or is this a good site for uh, solar panels? You find where south is. You aim your belt buckle south. And then you strike a pose, like Billy Graham addressing the masses, like this. Now, what have I done here? You see my hands are up about head height, and my palms are sort of like this, sort of angled up. What I've done is I've made a gesture of this space right here. I've defined that space. So if you have blue sky in between the palms of your hands, that means you've got clear sky in here where you're going to get 90% of your sun. So if you stand in the place that you're considering and you go like this and there's a tree sticking up in between the palms of your hands there, well, that's going to be right here and it's going to shade you. And you might want to either pull out the chainsaw or move your location, right? So. It's a very, you, people will look at you funny, but it's a very simple way to figure out whether something is a good solar site. If there's a mountain in the way, you're done. I mean, you, you know, you can't move that out of the way. Um, you've got to move yourself um, or your neighbor's building. You know, your neighbor would object to it being brought down. You, you're just going to have to move yourself, uh, move your project. So, um, It's important when you're, when you're citing 
a building or a solar array or something like that to figure out that in fact you have exposure to the sun. And another issue is um, the question of the angle of the glass. Now, back in the day when people were building solar buildings, they put the glass at like a 60 degree angle, right? Because during the winter, the sun would be coming in at a low angle, would hit the glass perpendicularly, would all go in, it'd be great. But the problem is that you, remember, we only want the sun to come in at a certain time and we want it to keep it out at other times. This is a chart of how much sun, how many equivalent sun hours you're going to get on a surface um, depending on its angle. So here's a five degree angle right here. That's like a skylight. And you can see that in January you're not getting so much. In June, July, you're getting twice as much, more than twice as much. And then in December, again, you're not getting a lot. So that's the exact opposite of what you want. Horizontal glass gives you the opposite of what you want. It's giving you lots of sunlight, lots of energy in the middle of summer. Now, if you look instead at this, this is 80 degrees, it's almost vertical. You can see that it's not quite so low in January, almost the same in December, but what's important is that in June and July, it's actually at its, it's actually lower than it is in February, March, September, October, when you might want more light coming in, and therefore more heat, more energy. So vertical glass, vertical south facing glass is a good thing because it will, it will allow you to collect energy when you want it, but the sun will be at a high angle in the summer and reflect off of it and you won't get energy when you don't want it. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a, just a shot from a, um, a book that the National Renewable Energy Lab puts out. And it's got information on how much heat is coming, you know, comes in through a square foot of glass and blah, blah, blah. Um, and shading. So here's that same chart shaded. So again, here's horizontal. You can see perfectly wrong. You're getting almost nothing in the uh, winter. You're getting lots in the summer. Here's uh, east and west facing uh, glass. This is the ends of your house. You can see that again vertical glass on the east and west end of your house. You get more in the summer, less in the winter, night, not quite so bad as horizontal glass. Um, north facing glass, you get almost nothing any time of the year. But here's um, vertical south facing glass right there. And again, you see that compared to your horizontal glass, you're getting almost twice as much, maybe twice as much in the winter and it goes down much lower in the summer and up again. So that's exactly what you want. But you notice they say with external shading. So NREL, people at NREL did a whole bunch of calculations for various places in the United States and said, how much shading of what kind do you need over a window so that it gives you the most heat in the winter when you want it and the least heat in the summer when you don't. How do you adjust that shading for that climate? Because you can have somebody who that's the same latitude as we are but might be up on a mountain in Colorado or something like that and or might be down in the, the Midwest somewhere and they'd have a different climate from us. They'd need different shading. But this is for Vermont. And what this chart means is that if you have a window that's one foot high, facing south, if you go up a third of a foot, four inches, and out two thirds of a foot, 
that will give you the optimum shading so that in the winter the sunlight will come into your entire window and will give you the maximum amount of heat. But in the summer, when the sun is high, that will shade your window and you won't get direct solar gain and you won't get heat. So that's the ratio and it changes depending on where you are in the United States. So how do you remember that? Almost Satan. It's not 666, it's 663. And this is almost half Satan. So you just think evil, half evil, that's the ratio. So if this was three feet high, a standard three foot window, then this would be one foot and that would be two foot. Two thirds, one third. And here's that, that same chart, just in color. But you can see it's kind of dramatic. Um, that uh, vertical glass facing south, nice dip right in the middle of summer, uh, and uh, horizontal glass, terrible. So the other thing you have to think about with solar design of a house is, well, what are we gonna do with all this energy that's come in the windows once it gets there. Now you get the, you, you have to worry about this because otherwise you get the car at the beach effect. You know, we've all driven the car to the beach and we get out and we go and we play around in the water, or whatever, we come back to the car at the end of the day and we open it up and sit down in the seat and scream because the car is like 200 degrees. I mean, it's just baking and the seat is incredibly hot. It's because you've got a box with a lot of glass in it but no mass. There's nothing to absorb all that heat that's been collected. So the temperature of the seats goes way up. Now if for some crazy reason you had a, a car with concrete seats, it wouldn't heat up. That energy, the mass of the concrete would absorb the energy from the sun and it would take a long, long time to warm that seat up because of all the mass. Or if you had like drums of water in your car, they would take a long time to heat up and they would store all that heat. So here's a classic experiment that some people did where they created some boxes and they glazed one side of them and they put them out in the sun. And this one was all insulation, it was just like you know, pink foam insulation with a window. This was all concrete with a window. And this was insulation with concrete inside it and a window. And these are the temperature graphs. There's A, all insulation. There was no storage for the heat. So in the middle of the night and into the, the wee hours of the morning, it cooled way down because there was nothing to hold the heat in it. And then when the sun came out during the day, the temperature went super high. And then as soon as the sun went down, the temperature dropped again. Now, if you do it all mass, just concrete, concrete's a terrible insulator, right? It, heat goes right through it, but it stores heat. And so, you got a little bit better, but not great. But when you put the insulation on the outside of mass, you both have storage and you don't have the heat escaping out and you get the shallowest curve. So it has the least amount of variation. So during the day, the energy comes in from the sun, it gets absorbed in the concrete and at night, it slowly comes back out again, but it doesn't go out into the world. So glass and mass, that's the key. And you can do all sorts of, of math about how much mass to how much glass, and blah, but that's beyond what we can go into here. But just understand that you, you, can't just, you can't just create a building with a wall of windows in it and not put some stone or brick 
or concrete or water or something in there to absorb all that heat coming in or else you're going to you're going to spend your afternoons baking cookies on your living room floor and then your night you know your nights freezing um, Another thing to think about in terms of solar design is that magnetic north is not solar north. Now, we're used to thinking of north as being where you aim the compass, right? You take the compass out and you look around and, and you line up the, the needle and that, that's north, right? Well, not really, because the geographic north pole where the Earth spins around, the, the pointing at Polaris, the pole star, is not the place where the magnetic North Pole is. The magnetic North Pole is actually over central Canada. So, if you're right on the Mississippi River, that magnetic North Pole lines up with the geographic North Pole and the Sun. If you're over here in Vermont, it's about 15 degrees off. So if you look at your magnetic compass and it's pointing north, real north is at 15 degrees to the right. And if you look and you're aiming your magnetic compass south, real solar south, where the sun is going to be in the middle of the day, where you want to point your house or your solar panels, that's going to be 15 degrees to the right. So don't be fooled by the compass. And if you're, if you're uh, out here in, in Northern California, it's going to be 15, 16, 17, or you're in, in um, Washington State, it's going to be 18 degrees off the other direction. But here, it's 15 degrees off. So. Don't get fooled by the compass. Of course, the comp a compass is notoriously unreliable because um, there are power lines. There's iron in the soil. There are underground power lines. There's metal in things. And it all conspires to move the compass needle around. But the sun will never fool you. You can find true solar south with a newspaper and a rock and a piece of string. You tie the rock on the end of the piece of string and you get your local newspaper. And in your local newspaper it will tell you the times of sunrise and sunset. And if you take today's time of sunrise and sunset and you do a little math and you find the point in time that is actually halfway in between. It won't, it'll generally not be noon because clock time is also different from solar time. But you find that distance, the, the time halfway in between sunrise and sunset and you go outside at that time and you dangle the rock on the end of the string the shadow of the string at that time will go directly north because the sun will be in the middle of its travel and that will be true solar south and that line is where you want to aim your house or aim your solar panels to get the most sun throughout the day the sun will never fool you. So when people think of solar architecture, this is sort of what they think about a lot. Um, the cheese wedge building. Um, it's ugly, it's utilitarian, it has angled windows, um, and it's just like not particularly appealing. That's what people thought solar architecture was back in the 1970s. But before and after that time, solar architecture was different. This is solar architecture. This is a mill building from the 19th century down in New Jersey. Um, and of course, in the 19th century, uh, lighting was expensive. It was kerosene or whale oil or something like that. And so they designed this building with lots of windows and you can see a big overhang so that during the summer, it would uh, at least shield the upper windows there. So they used daylighting. And people don't think of daylighting as solar energy, but 
If you imagine trying to have all our buildings with no windows in them and replacing that with electric light, we'd be paying a huge amount of money for the service that the sun will do for us just by having a window. Um, so that's a solar building. Um, this is a solar building. Now you see that cupola up there, or Belvedere. Now, I can imagine that, the, I've never been in this building, but I can imagine there's a stairwell going right up the center of this house. And so in the summer, you can open those windows in the Belvedere. And you can see all the trees around that house, which would kind of shield it from the sun. You could open a window down low and sit in front of that window and the chimney effect would give you a fan. The air coming in that window and getting chimneyed up out of that Belvedere would effectively be an electric fan without the electricity. So there you have, it would also bring in cool air to cool the building, so it's solar air conditioning in effect. Um, so there's solar architecture, it doesn't look like a cheese wedge. That's solar architecture. This is a farmhouse, again, down in New Jersey. These are slides I borrowed from my uh, friend uh, John Ringel, who's an architect down there. This is a classic 19th century farmhouse. It has a porch facing south so that the windows on the first floor are shaded by that porch in the summer. And it has big deciduous trees planted in the southeast and southwest corners. So during the summer, it's in a little island of shade there. It's probably 10 or 15 degrees cooler around that house than it is out here in that field. That's absolutely passive solar design from the 19th century. They had to do it. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have electricity. I mean, they couldn't just like turn on the air conditioner, so they had to do that. And then here's a picture of it in the winter, a little broader picture of the thing, but you can see all the leaves drop off the trees and the sun can come right in there and heat the building somewhat. And you can see that around the north side of the building in the back, they've got evergreen trees. Now, you, you hear about the wind chill, right, in the winter, you know, the wind chill factor, it's 32 degrees, but with the wind chill, it's, you know, 22. Well, wind chill happens to buildings, too. And so just as you would put on a windbreaker or a coat when the wind comes up in the winter to keep the wind off of you, or if you're outside, you might step around behind a building or something to keep the wind from blowing across and cooling you down, in the same way, if you plant a bunch of evergreens around the north side of your building, then you've put an overcoat on your house that protects it from the northern winds. So there's passive solar design in a way in that it's, it's protecting your house so that it is only exposed to the south where the sun is coming from, but not where the wind is coming from. And this is uh, solar design. This is a simple sort of move that, that uh, uh, people do. Regular house, type house, and they built a porch, a sun porch off of it. It has an overhang. It has a glazing uh, made from, um, oh, what is it? A sliding glass door replacement glass because that's the most common and cheap large glass you can get because people are always kicking through uh, uh, sliding glass doors by mistake. So they always have to replace them, so it's cheap glass. So they put those in and they put little ventilation slots down here where they can pull the glass out and ventilate it in the summer. Um, so it's vertical glass, south facing glass with an overhang and inside a masonry floor. They have a foundation with insulation on the sides and insulation underneath, so they've got that big chunk of concrete and a dark colored floor right in there, so the sunlight coming in gets absorbed into the floor, and so it stays a reasonable temperature. And then later, 
the floor will radiate that heat out and keep it warm. So that's very simple solar design. And the other thing that people sometimes do is if they have a porch off the south side of their house, they'll just glaze in the porch. We have a glazed in porch, has the south side, and it stays warm later in the season. And on a sunny day, you open the door and you let the heat come in in the winter. And then when it's not sunny, you close the door and you let this become whatever temperature it is. But it's, it's like a ready-made solar collector on the south side of your house. And this is a, a building that um, uh, my friend John Ringle designed. And uh, this is the south side. You can see a big overhang, glazing, not so much glazing, east and west. And that's the north side. You'll notice two tiny little windows, because you're not going to get anything through them anyway. They're just for a little bit of illumination. And this is the garage. We talked about putting, um, I talked about putting uh, uh, evergreen trees around the north side of your house as this kind of an overcoat. Well, a garage is kind of an overcoat too. Garage doesn't care how warm or cold it is. It can be a low temperature area, but it can be a buffer for the rest of your house. If that's your overcoat for the rest of the house. It takes the brunt of the winds out of the north northwest and the rest of your house stays a little bit warmer. Uh, this is another interesting little move. Um, it's very hard to shield yourself on the east and west from the sun because the sun is just barely coming up over the horizon. You, you'd have to have an overhang that would go out seven miles over the horizon to keep it out. But what you can do is you can plant ivy or hops or some other climbing plant on uh, a trellis to the east or to the west and in the summer it will grow up and it will provide a nice screen to your porch or your window or whatever and then in the winter it will die away again and the sun will come in. So um, there, are, there are moves like that that you can do with landscaping, basically, that grow up and protect you in the summer when you want some protection and go away in the winter when you don't want it. I think that's my last slide. Um, so, I guess I'm just going to turn that off. Um, that's pretty much what I've got for the moment. Um, if you have any questions about particular things, happy to answer. So I'm just trying to give an overview of, of the, the, the basics of uh, how to deal with your, your house and the sun and have your house so that it'll invite the sun in when you want and keep it out when you don't. Now I've shown you some things that are, that are pretty good if you're designing a house that hasn't been built yet. A few things that are good if you already have a house and you want to modify it in some way. But I'm you know, open to questions if you have them about particular uh, uh, things to do with a particular situation or anything like that. Uh, uh, could you <clears throat> give a quick overview of the state of the art, the technology that is taking place with respect to solar panels? In other words, in the old days, hmm. they were, you know, expensive and not very good. So now they're moving into things like uh, shingles. And yeah. Stuff. What is the, if you were an architect, you talked about that there, but could you, in building a house, orienting it properly vis-a-vis -vis hmm. the south and west hmm. and east and so forth, uh, would you say, well, nowadays you wouldn't put great big slabs on top of the thing. Mm. You could use uh, shingles. Yeah. The efficiency or the expense or the pros and cons. Or what other technologies coming down to mm. 
Well, the thing is that, that um, what's called BIPV, Building Integrated Photovoltaics, is really big in Europe because they have some pretty standard sizes of roof tiles. They do a lot of tile roofs over there. And so people make solar roof tiles that all clip together like that. The problem is over here we tend not to have tile roofs and we tend not to have standardized products except for shingles. Um, so we haven't gotten into the integrated roof products over here the way they have in Europe. Um, in addition, those roof tiles, you pay a premium for nice looking roof. And so people have been willing to make the sacrifice over here and just say, okay, we're going to have solar panels. Now, one thing that has happened is that the efficiency of modules has gone up and up. Uh, whereas, you know, years and years ago, you had maybe 10% efficiency. That was good. Nowadays, it's up around 20%, 21% maximum. The theoretical maximum efficiency of uh, a silicon solar panel is like 33.5%. So that's pretty good, getting to 21. Um, and you can get those modules for a reasonable price. Um, what, <laughs> what benefited us was the, uh, actually the financial collapse that over in Europe, they had all these incentives for installing solar. And then the financial collapse came 2007, 2008, and they took all those, those incentives away. But before then, all the manufacturers had ramped up their production and built new factories and all that to, to feed that demand that didn't show up. And so suddenly the price of modules dropped. It used to be, when I was in the business way back when, we, we would talk about modules for a dollar a watt the way people would talk about when I win the lottery, right? I mean, this was like dreamland, like someday we'll have modules for a dollar a watt. Well, I just got an advertisement email from a supplier of mine saying, special 49 cents a watt for mm -hmm. modules, you know, on a pallet, which it's like, it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And, you know, and other ones for like 75 cents a watt. So their modules have gone well below a dollar a watt. And so um, at this point, people are trying to carve money out of like how cheap can we make the mounting and how cheap can we do the wiring and how cheap can we do the, like everything else. It used to be that solar panels were 75% of a solar job. And now they're more like 20% of a solar job. You know, they're not the factor that they were. So the efficiencies have gone up. But more importantly, the cost has gone way down. Um, we're probably never going to see efficiencies of more than about 20, 25%. There are modules in the laboratory that people are making that are like 40% efficient, but they cost a mint and you have to focus concentrated sunlight on them and all this. It's, it's really complicated and expensive. What it really gets down to is, after a while is What's your cost per produced kilowatt hour? Mm -hmm. It costs you a certain amount to make the panel and the, the, and the wiring and the, the inverter and all the electronics and install them. That's your capital cost. And the maintenance cost is practically nothing, right? The fuel is free coming out of the sky. So you take that capital cost and you extend it over the lifetime of the module, which is like 25 years or more. And you say, well, what does that work out to in terms of kilowatt hours that it'll produce? And right now, that price has gone down to about 10 cents a kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. um, or even less. So at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, you're making money in Vermont. You, know, you, you actually have a payback. It used to be that solar was a green sacrifice you made. Now it's the better investment than Wall Street. Because That's, you're putting power back to the grid. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And you're getting paid retail for it. Yeah. So you can, if, if, if I, went to an investment advisor and said, look, I want an investment that pays 6 to 12%. I want it to be insured, inflation adjusted, and tax free. Right. My investment advisor would spit his coffee all over the desk laughing. 
Or if he didn't have coffee, he would find some coffee and drink it and then laugh and spit it all over the desk, right? I want to meet that guy. Yeah, right. Because, you know, it's ridiculous. You cannot find an investment in the world today that will pay you 6 to 12% and is insured and tax-free and inflation-adjusted, except for solar. Right. Because you're saving money, right? You're knocking money off your electrical bill, so it's tax-free. It's attached to your house, so it's covered by your homeowner's insurance. Mm -hmm. So it's insured, and it's gonna, your return is going to go up roughly with inflation as the price of electricity goes up. Mm -hmm. So it has all those three things, and it'll get you 6 to 12% interest. So if you have any money in the stock market right now, you'd be well advised to take it out and put in solar, because you'll get way more <laughs> return at way less risk. So. Well, unless some smart person from Wall Street would uh, put together a, a mutual fund, where every person who is in the fund is buying into houses all over the bloody place that have been done. It has. Yes, you can now do actually, it's not quite that, but you can do what's called community solar, where somebody builds a big array and you can buy a portion of it mm -hmm. and you get the, the benefits of, the, of that output of that portion of the array. But is there liquidity? In other words, is this something that's either um, listed on exchange or over the counter? I don't, there are, I think, some funds that are doing that now mm -hmm. that you can buy into because some. So that would, in effect, be a fund that's taking advantage of the things that you yeah. just mentioned. Yeah, it's, so. it's a tricky, tricky legal thing to uh, take the financial benefits of one of these things and route it through with all the tax benefits and right. things like that. Yeah. It takes more legal minds than I have right, right, right. to, well, to do that. Where, that's, where, that's where the sharks come in. That's where the sharks come in. I don't, think they, I don't think that's really, because of the complexities of transferring the tax benefits and things like that, I don't think that's really come through yet, but they do have things where people are buying portions of a solar array. Yeah. And now that they're putting in 40 megawatt, 100 megawatt solar arrays out in the, the desert southwest, right. um, Wells Fargo is getting into it. Mm -hmm. You know, there are huge companies getting into the, right. into the, into the market yeah. now. So it's an investment. Yeah. You have a question? You mentioned the, the life of a solar panel. Yeah. Right? Which is 20 to 25, 30 years at least. The original solar panel made at Bell Labs in 1962 is still producing energy, if that gives you any idea. That's, and that was my question when I started thinking about it. What happens, when the, do they wear out? They slowly lose a little bit of, about a quarter of a percent a year on average. So what happens when they do wear, when, if they do wear out? Well, eventually, um, you can actually uh, break them apart and take the silicon and remelt it and make new, you can make new glass, make new aluminum, make new, uh, there's actually recycling programs that, okay. that these uh, uh, companies have. Because the original modules that, that people put out back in the 1980s are now starting to deteriorate. And it's not the silicon, it's not the glass and aluminum, it's the adhesive. They have special glue that glues the individual cells onto the back of the glass, and that stuff ages. And so um, they're starting to, to replace them because of that. But the silicon's still good, and the, and the glass is still good, and the aluminum's still good, and they, they melt it down and start again. But so really, it's... Uh, thinking, but, okay, like, is it like nuclear power where we have this horrible waste, what do yeah. we do with it? But, but yeah, this is all recyclable, and it, it'll easily last. I've seen 30, 35-year-old panels still cranking away. You know, no problem. Okay. Sure. Um, What's your opinion of trackers versus fixed panels? Trackers versus fixed panels. Um, nowadays, modules are so cheap that it's actually financially in your interest to just buy more modules and point them south. Because a tracker can only hold so many modules and it costs a certain amount of money. And you're gaining, you know, 25, 35% by tracking, but you're paying for this very expensive mounting system for a limited number of, of panels. And really when you do the math, you just say, well, no, we'll just, 
Just buy more panels at 75 cents a watt and point them south and you'll be ahead of the game. That seemed to be what your charts were indicating. Yeah. Because your maximum insulation was at the same Yeah, yeah. Unless you have an application where you want a lot of extra power in the middle of the summer. If you're doing air conditioning or like pumping water for stock tanks, you know, for animals or something where they're going to be drinking a lot more water in the summer. So you're like, you really want to maximize your summer output. Then a tracker makes sense. But if you're just, you know, net metering and, and you know, building up credits in the summer and using them in the winter, blah, 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 point them south. Yeah. At an angle about eight degrees below latitude is probably the best for up here. Because in the winter, they get snowed on. There's not much light anyways. Theoretically, the maximum would be at, at latitude. So half the time the sun's below, and half the time the, sun, the sun's above the angle. But winter hours are not as good as summer hours. So it's better to tip it down a little bit and take more advantage of the summer hours when the, there's more reliable sun. No. So, you know, all of the things that you were saying about siting and, yeah. you know, all of that seems to me like stuff that someone could have figured out a hundred years ago or 2,000 years ago. Years ago. Yeah. yeah. You go to the desert southwest, you look at the Anasazi cliff dwellings. Mm -hmm. They face south, they're semicircular facing south. Thick adobe walls that absorb the sun during the day and then radiate the heat from the walls at night. And they evolved. They figured out, in a vernacular sense over time, the right thickness for the adobe so that the heat would just barely reach the inside by the end of the day. And then it would keep radiating at night and that there would be a kind of a chimney effect going up the steps of the, uh, the, the various levels of the, uh, the uh, dwellings to create a breeze going up through and ventilate them during the day. So, you know, and that was, that was you know, 1,500, 2,000 years ago, and they figured that out, because they had to, right? They lived in a, in a hot climate, and they, you know, they didn't have any other way to deal. PG&E. No, no, no PG&E, nothing. Um, so, so is that, is the reason that people here didn't figure that stuff out? I mean, they figured out some stuff about siting, you know, just looking at how older, you know, 18th and early 19th century yeah. houses are sited. You can see that people were thinking about the sun, yeah. but not in, in, to that degree of sophistication. Is that because there were other resources available for eating and therefore people didn't dive in that deeply? Well, basically, um, people had different expectations, right? So back in the 18th century, 19th century, you expected to burn 10 cords of wood a year and huddle around the wood stove in the kitchen all winter and break the ice in the face bowl in your room first thing in the morning, you know, in your bedroom. And that was just the way it is. You know, sleep under six inches of covers and be cold. That was just like, mm, all right. Um, and then when people uh, started mining coal and we tapped into this infinite supply of energy, basically, people started getting more and more into just like, oh yeah, put more coal in there and we're good. And when people got into the oil age in the early 20th century, houses changed. People didn't have to worry about like, well, you know, is there is there the heat coming in, blah, 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 whatever. It's like, wow, we can just be comfortable by turning this little knob on the wall, right? And oil was cheap. So why worry about which way you point your house? And then we got air conditioning, and it's like, well, who cares about shading? I mean, there's all these amazing things you can do that are not rocket science, but you wouldn't think of unless you were deprived of air conditioning. I mean, a classic thing is um, here's your here's a uh, overhead view of your house, and here's south. Um, and let's say that the wind in the summer comes from the southeast, which it does around here, right? It's going to be coming in from here. So you either plant or leave 
Um, southwest, pardon me. Southwest, thank you. Um, you either plant or leave a bunch of trees here to the southwest, and you cut out the understory of them. So trees are constantly transpiring, right? They're constantly giving off moisture uh, through their leaves, and that tends to cool the area underneath them. You, if you cut up the understory a little ways, what you get is the wind blowing to your house through this cooled space. You've got a natural growing air conditioner to the southwest of your house. And you never have to put electricity into it, but it's going to lower the temperature of your house by, I don't know, 5 degrees, 10 degrees, something like that. Um, and that's the kind of things people used to think about. I mean, if you have your house with your deciduous trees right here, right here, and your, your evergreens shielding it here, I mean, you're halfway home, right? You're being kept, you're being protected from the north winds in the winter. You're being protected from the sun in the summer. You've got the summer breeze going through a cool area to go into your house. You put your cupola on here so you can, you can uh, open a window on the north side of the house and funnel cool air from the north side of your house through your house, um, and so on. How far would you say, roughly, I know it depends on the square foot of the house, but if you were citing that and you talk about the deciduous and the, uh, and the evergreens, how far away from the north would you put the evergreens from, from the house? I mean, oh, from the house. Are we, are we talking uh, 10 yards, uh, 30, I mean, um, you, could, you could put them 50 feet away. I mean, it's, they don't have to be right up against the house. It's really what you want is you want a solid line of them. Well, you're breaking wind. I mean, I beg your pardon. You know, the north wind is yeah. coming down yeah. in the winter, and the snow and the sleet and the ice. Yeah. And so you don't want them too close to the house for obvious reasons. But yeah. you want them close enough so that they have the effect that you're talking about. Right, right. You'd have to, you'd have to put them quite a ways away to, for them to not have an effect. You know, but, but you know, 50 feet or, or so, 25, 50 feet or so, they're going to shield your house. Um, anything that slows the wind down going past your house is going to help. Right. So. Yeah. So, I mean, the other thing is if you build your house in uh, next to a, you know, on the, on the south slope of a hill, the hill's in the way. And so you're right. you're good there, but you know if you're out in the field, that's how uh, that's how you would take care of it. And then you know if you want to if you want to complete the picture, you put a porch on the south that overhangs, protects your your first floor windows. You uh, glaze it in. You allow it to have you know you can take the glazing out and leave screens in there. Then you've got a solar heater on the south side of your house. You know you're on your way to having a house that that. Uh, heats and cools itself. And in fact, if you are really cagey about this stuff, even in Vermont, you can build a house that will almost, but not quite, completely heat and cool itself. If you seal it up well enough and insulate it well enough and size your glass and mass well enough and orient it and shield it, it, it you know, it'll pretty much do the work. Are you talking uh, passive? Passive house kind of Passive house kind of work, yeah, yeah. There was a debate, an online debate, between Amory Lovins at the Rocky Mountain Institute and Mark Rosenberg, who's a, a very well-regarded consultant in terms of doing this kind of passive solar work, about whether you could actually have a house in the Northeast that would totally heat itself. And they were dueling equations and dueling numbers back and forth about, well, if you, know, if you optimize this just you know, another 5% and optimize that, and Mark was saying, uh, Amory Lovins was saying, yes, you can do this. And Mark was, Mark was saying, no, you qu can't quite do that. And you say, well, you know, what about this? What about that? Colorado. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, Amory Lovins. Um, Rocky Mountain Institute, they grow bananas in their greenhouse in Colorado. So, 
Hang on. If you take advantage of solar panels, you can put yourself sort of that's the tipping point. Yeah. Actually, there's an architect, um, my acquaintance down in Connecticut, uh, John Roundtree, who has a regular sort of house looking house, right? And what he did, he wanted to put solar on the roof. So he put solar hot water up in the corners of his roof. And in the center of his roof, he took the roof out. And, and in the joist area there, he made troughs that were waterproof troughs. And then he put the solar panels, the solar electric panels over that. And he put um, a plenum, air plenum at the top and bottom. So that when the sun was out, the modules would heat up and he'd blow air over the backs of them and collect that heat into his house. And while in, they were generating electricity. While they were generating electricity. And in the summer, he would just let the heat out the top. And his is just like a pretty normal looking house, except it's got solar panels on the roof. And I think he provides 60% of the energy needs of his house just from solar. And it's just a like normal, it's not like, it wasn't built as a passive house. It's just like a normal house. And he still basically provides 60% of the heating and electricity energy use. So he's, he's got water storage in his rafters somehow. Well, no, he's got, he's got a regular solar hot water system with a tank in the basement. And he's just got the, the hot air being blown down into his house. Oh, okay. And I think he's just got, he's got mass storage in his house for that. But, you know, it's doable. Mm. Of course, he's down in Connecticut. You know, the banana belt. But. Well, that's good. All right. Good. Thank well, thank you. you for coming out. Yeah. And thank, thank you folks for, for being here and uh, come back. This exhibit is here through Saturday and uh, our next exhibit is called Geomorph and it's uh, work by a photographer from Newfane, Vermont whose uh, studio was destroyed by her, uh, Tropical Storm Irene and from that destruction came a whole new inspiration to create, uh, to look at the world in a different way through which she then created a new body of work. So the exhibit is both it displaying this work created post Irene and looking at her personal process of making lemonade from lemons, finding creative energy from loss and the, 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 the charting the path to a new flowering of her work. So, come again. Thank you. Yep. Let's see you in the morning. Yes, I believe you will. Good. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That was good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming out. It's your business, architecture, or solar um, so I'm a consultant. Uh -huh. And a uh, solar installer. What's your name? Hilton Dyer. Oh, I know your name. Stand up. You knew it?